Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mabin Sheikh, and I want to talk to you about optimizing treatment planning with Barajal. Some disclosures about me. Um, I'm the Director of Medical Physics at Rochester Regional Health. We, we have multiple locations and sites, and, and in our program, we've, we've used Barajal, and have used Barajal in many other clinics that I've worked in as well. Did you know that for a single patient, the possible number of treatment plans available for that patient exceed the number of people living on the earth. Let's, let's think about that for a moment. Let's pretend you got Mr. Smith and Mr. Smith has prostate cancer. And we're gonna treat Mr. Smith with rapid arc or VMAT specific technique. So in this particular technique, what happens is the machine, the gantry, rotates around the patient. And as it does so, it delivers affluence to the treatment site. Now, if you look from a probability perspective, right, the total number of possible treatment plans that you could have for Mr. Smith is very, very large, larger than the population of people living on this earth. It's one of the reasons that we can't possibly look at all possible solutions. Instead, we have tools like optimizers. And what an optimizer does is that you give it constraints and it looks at the, and then it tells you what possible plans will meet your constraints. Now, when you use an optimizer, eventually what happens is that the optimizer converges on a solution where it becomes a zero-sum game. Allow me to explain that. So let's say the prostate and the rectum are real close to one another. Well, in that situation, when the optimizer tries to give more dose and get better coverage to the PTV, it ends up increasing the dose to the rectum. And, and if it ed tries to reduce the dose to the rectum, it ends up delivering, losing PTV coverage. So it's a zero-sum game where there are two competing cost functions that are limiting it. And so what you end up happening is you have only a finite space of plants that will meet your constraints. When you use a product like Barajal, what happens is the available options, the available treatment plans available to you increases significantly. And the purpose of my webinar today is to talk to you about the importance of spacing and how the space impacts the treatment plans that you have available to you. Once we've kind of gone through that, what I want to do is dive a little bit deeper and help you understand an important concept. What is possible? What can you achieve when you have spacing or you have a tool like Barajal? Once we cover those two basic topics, we're going to jump on to number two, which is slightly more advanced. And it's going to look at the planning and treatment challenges when you have asymmetric implants. You see, a product like Barajal is very symmetric. You can make very symmetric implants. But there are other products on the market that also offer implants that are considerably less symmetric. And when you have a non-symmetric implant, there are some unique challenges that come into play. And I want to talk to you about that by showing you an example of what challenges you introduce on the planning side and what you introduce on the treatment. Last but not least, everyone that has used Barajal, that I get this question a lot from people, and it's like, can you see Barajal on CT? And, and I think the best way to answer that question is to talk about CT visibility, what is achievable, and what you need to do to help improve it. So before we wrap up here, I want to kind of talk to you, give share with you some of the tools I use to improve visibility of Barajal on those CT scans. Now, I know for this webinar, we have a mixed audience. And so what I like to do is take a moment and kind of go over the basics. So I really like this slide because it kind of gives you the visual interpretation, right? On the left, what you can see here is the prostate and the rectal wall. When you're treating a patient, what ends up happening is you have this high dose region as shown by the green line and then a low dose region. And oftentimes when there's limited spacing, the rectal wall is in the high dose region. Nothing new here. 
When you have a spacer, what you're doing is you're pulling the rectal wall outside that high dose region. And it's significant. Here's a here's a little interesting fact. If you look at the hypofractionated uh, protocol that, that was done on Baragel patients, they gave 60 gray and 20 fractions, so three gray a fraction. And the end point in that trial was they were looking at the, they were looking to see that there's a 25% reduction in the rectal V54 gray. So V54 gray is the 90% isodose line, right? And what they found is that 98.5% of these patients had at least a 25% reduction in the rectal V54 gray. Put in plain speak, what that really is trying to say is that a spacer helps pull the rectal wall outside the high dose region. Right. What's also quite interesting from that study is that the patients that did meet this primary endpoint, which is 98.5% of them, well, these patients had a significant reduction in the V54 to the extent of almost 85% reduction. So significant. Now you might go and say, well, you know, we've treated prostate and the rectal wall's always been there. We haven't had issues per se. Yeah, that, that is true. You see, the rectum is kind of a unique organ. It's not, it's about the parallel and serial organ. It just depends on what metric you're using. So if you go look at the data that we have out there, and if your endpoint that you're most concerned with is bleeding, then the rectum behaves very much like a serial organ. It's where we get these numbers, V70 less than 25, V75 less than 5%. These numbers, they come from studies that show that the rectum behaves very much like a serial organ. Now, if your endpoint is fecal incontinence, well, then the rectum behaves very much like a parallel organ, and metrics like V40 become very important. Ultimately, the endpoint is the rectum is a sensitive organ at risk. We want to not only limit the maximum doses to it because it has a serial nature, but we also want to reduce the cumulative dose to it because it also demonstrates a parallel um, relationship there. So in my clinic, we use we do hypofractionated prostate, as most places are doing these days, and that's 70 gray and 2.5 gray fractions. Our PTV uh, has margins of 7 millimeters all around and 5 millimeters posterior. I know some places use a lot less, but these are the ones that we're most comfortable with. When it comes to coverage, what we try to do in my clinic is we try to make sure that the V100 is greater than 98 and that the hotspot is less than 107. Obviously, there are situations where we have to take exceptions, and those very exceptions are going to be V100 going down to 95 and the hotspots going up to 110. Or those limits for the rectum and bladder, they are listed here. They come from the NRG Contouring Atlas, and they are V65, V55, V45. And, and we also want to limit the portion of the rectum and bladder that get the 105 prescription point. So we want to limit that to five cc's. We do things, we, we limit the dose to the small bowel, colon, femoral heads, and penile bowel. These constraints are probably similar to what you use in your clinic as well. Um, I want to be honest and tell you something that if you, that you'll realize very quickly, these numbers for the rectum and bladder, they're very easy to hit most of the time. Most clinics can be able to, but when it comes to a patient with with spacing, with barogel. Well, in those situations, you know, meeting these constraints for the rectum is very easy. I want to tell you a story, okay? A few years ago, I hired a, a junior decimetrist. He just got out of school. He'd gotten a CMT. He'd, he'd done the coursework. He'd done the didactics that he needed to. He had an understanding about treatment planning. He had done some fair bit of it. And so what I did is I gave him these constraints, you know, and I said, okay, well, now that you are a CMD and you're joining our team, here's a prostate patient. It's got a spacer. These are dose constraints. I want you to give it your best shot, right? And so he worked on the plan, and a couple hours later, he came back, and he showed me what he got. And for those of you who have used Eclipse, I'm going to just kind of show you some of what he what he presented to me. So the what you're seeing here is is the pronounced from Eclipse. You have on the left, you have the transverse cut. We have the PTV, the spacer, and the rectum. 
And if you've ever used Eclipse, you know that Eclipse can show you the dose in a dose color wash. So uh, instead of the isodose lines, um, I'm showing this in a color wash um, per se. You have one cut on the left and then you have the other one on the right. This is the plan that you can easily knock out when you have a spacer. So this plan that you're seeing here met all of those constraints that I just showed you. Met it, but it wasn't the most optimal plan, right? Allow me to explain. What you can see right here in these cuts, transverse cuts, you can see how the rectum is just getting bathed by the 30% and the 50% isodose line. And, and this happens. I mean, if you've ever done treatment planning, you know that when you push the optimizer to cover a PTV, it's not going to limit the dose to the rectum. And so you end up getting a very washed out dose like this. And when you have a spacer, you have something very unique. I remember I talked to you earlier at the start of this presentation, we talked about how the possible number of plans that are there, possible for any single, it's very loud fast. What's also very interesting is that when you have a spacer, those number of possible treatment plans gets even bigger. So in this case, what you're seeing is this is one possible treatment plan that you can get with the spacer. Is it the most optimal plan? Absolutely not. So here's what I did with this gentleman, um, with my new junior decimetrist. So we went back and we replanned that case. And we got a distribution which looks something like this. I'm going to show you the, the transverse cut because it shows the information that's most relevant can be seen in this. So on the left is the plan that he initially came up with where he was optimizing to the PTV. And so the 30% I saw this line is just, which is the 21 gray line, is just bathing the rectum. It's just covering it. Now on the right, what you're seeing is the same patient now we're optimizing both to the PTV and OER. And you can see how much tighter that 30% isodose line is. And you can see how tighter the 50 and the 30% isodose line is. So when you introduce a spacer, what you do is you create space here between the prostate and rectum. You allow the optimizer more possibility to deliver the dose to the PTV while still protecting the rectum. When there's no space and there's limited space, guess what happens? These two get real close. And when you get real close, you reach a zero-sum game and you have to make those more challenging trade-offs. Spacers simplify your workflow. Spacer like Barajal makes it easier for you to deliver a high-quality plan without having to make those difficult choices that you usually have to make. And one of the things I notice is when you have these patients with spacers, it's very important that you use the spacer to its full advantage. It's so easy to come knock out a plan when you have a spacer to meet those dose constraints. But really what the spacer from Barajal is doing is it's allowing you to further optimize your treatment plan in ways that you can better improve quality of care for your patient. Um, I know some of you like to see that same information on a DVH, so I'm going to present the rectum DVH. The blue line here is the PTV optimized, as you can see. These red dots represent the dose constraints from the NRG that we're going to try to meet. And this here is the PTV with OER. You can see that vast difference that you can get in the rectal doses just by introducing a little bit of space in it. Between a, a small little spacer that allows you to change the geometry, allows your machine the ability to deliver a much conformal dose without losing out on that coverage. So I get this question a lot. How much, how much is rectal spacing is achievable when you have this rectal space? What is really achievable is really the core thing. So this a colleague of mine's put this slide together, and I think it's an excellent slide. So I want to just draw your attention to it. Um, it looks at a lot of publications that are out there, and it looks and presents the relative rectal volume and the relative. So think of this like a DVH. The squares that are filled in, those are these are the studies where the patients, you know, did not have any spacing. All right. And you can see the rectum takes takes the shape of a 45 degree line. That's really what you can achieve when you when you have no spacing or you have no rectal spacer. When you introduce a spacer, what ends up happening is you get this concave shape. These are all the studies where you know you have spacers introduced, 
right? And you can see this very vast difference that's coming. So a tool like a spacer, what it does is it allows you to optimize your DVH, rectal DVH, where it reduces the max hotspots right there, but it also allows you to reduce the cumulative dose to the rectum. And especially if you're looking at, if the rectum is considered, you're looking at the endpoints where it behaves like a parallel organ, these things are, this is very important. Reducing that cumulative has a significant impact. So now that we've talked about what is achievable, I think one of the important things I want to get at is the dangers that we run into when we have a non-symmetric implant. Barrage implants are very symmetric. There's a lot of data out there. There's many presentations that show their symmetric implants uh, for various reasons. The other competing products are not as symmetric. They, and people often say, well, an implant's an implant. Symmetric or not symmetric, it still gives me spacing. And I want to kind of dispel that myth a little bit. I want to, I want to talk to you about the challenges one introduces when you have a non-symmetric implant. So this is a patient that was implanted by Space OAR. You can see several cuts of that prostate cut. You can see the red is the prostate, the rectum, this here's your spacer, right? You can see in this particular slide deck, it looks really great. You know, there's good adequate spacing going on. It gets a little less over here. You, it's a non-symmetric. So there's a little separation here, a lot more separation here. And then it gets extremely limited separation as you go further down. So let's consider these scenarios. Scenario one, when you have adequate spacing, you know, it's easy for the optimizer to deposit dose to the P2 without impacting or constraints. You don't end up in situations where the optimizer is, has a zero-sum game where it's trying to deliver P2 coverage while limiting dose to the uh, rectum, right? When you get into a scenario like this, okay, now it's non-symmetric. So what ends up happening is, you know, the optimizer is very intelligent in that it sees that there's limited spacing here and there's more spacing here. So when you push the optimizer to limit the dose to the rectum, it tends to force more fluence from one side, from this angle right here, if you can see my arrow. And that change, that has an impact. You can see this best by looking at the isodose lines that you have for your patient. You know, one trick I learned over the years, uh, over the last two decades when I've been checking plans and doing treatment planning is you can learn a lot about how the how an individual optimized a plan just by looking at the low-dose isodose lines. Those low dose isodose lines give you invaluable information about how it was optimized. Now we turn over to this slide. Look, there's inadequate surf. And now the optimizer is just going to make a trade off, right? If you push the optimizer and say reduce the rectal dose, it's just going to take away PTV coverage, right? And that's, that's the situation that you often will run into and you're just making trade offs. So non symmetric implants introduce these unique challenges in the planning process. They've they have you work on the planning side in slightly different ways where you have to push the optimizer to deliver dose in a non-uniform way. Instead of giving equal dose from left and the right, you might end up delivering a lot more. And you might say, well, you know, that's that's a small price to pay. What I want to do is turn your attention is to take the same exact patient, and I want to push this idea a little bit further. I want to show you what are the impact that happens on the day of treatment. Same same patient, didn't change anything. So what I did is I converted the isodose lines from Eclipse into color lines here, so it's easier to see. You have the blue isodose line, which is the 21 gray right here, and you have the red 35 gray isodose line. Prostate, spacer, rectum. Now, we all know our patients don't always follow the prep as exactly as we tell them, especially on the first day. Uh, we tell them to follow a certain prep, some of them comply, some of them don't. So take a look at what happened to the same patient that was planned with the space OAR. You can see the rectum is quite different from the first day of treatment compared to what it was there. It's a, and you can see the rectum is kind of moving against it. It's moving in the most least optimal. The space separation is the least here, and it's actually pushing towards that side. All right? So we see these isolated lines. This is what we planned. This is what we got on the day of the treatment. Now, I'm going to take the step one more step further. I'm going to overlay those isodose lines onto it. And now you can compare what is happening. So, non-symmetric implant. When you have a non-symmetric implant and there's rectal changes, it's possible that your rectum might move into the area and get a lot higher dose 
than what you had planned to deliver. And this example shows it. You know, the dream of has always been adaptive radiotherapy, the ability to replan a patient on the that day. And you know, many of the companies that we have in our market today are are working on it. There are tools for it, there's systems that are being built, but they are not seamless still. There are still some challenges with them. Uh, and the reality is when you have a non-symmetric implant and there are anatomical changes, the plan distribution is different than the delivered distribution. Now, obviously, we're not going to treat this patient with this kind of geometry every single day. If they come in every single day, we're going to either resim them or we're going to have them get off the table and use the facilities. But it goes to the bigger point is that when you have non-symmetric implants, you introduce some complications, both on your planning side and on the treatment side. And these are just one of the many examples that you'll have to deal with. Now, I know that when you use a thing like Baragel, the big question that comes up is CT visibility. Can I see this on it? So let's talk a little bit about CT window and level optimization. Remember, how CT is showing you information in house field units, right? And it's all relative to water. So when you are looking at something like Baragel, right, which is very water equivalent, right? It, on a regular CT, you're going to see something like this, as we see on the left, especially if your window level is really, really large. But if you adjust your window level down and you adjust it, you see something quite different. You begin to see that difference between the barrel and the rectal wall a lot more clearly. And these slide, this slide just kind of shows you that difference. You know, if you want to scan, there is a there's a document that we put together at Baragel that kind of walks you through things you can do to further optimize your um, visualization of Baragel. Um, just to come full circle on this point is, remember, Baragel is very similar to tissue. And if you want to be able to visualize the best, you need to reduce that windowing level and tighten it up. Uh, and so just a word of caution on that. The other things that we've noticed of, from many clinics is that to improve visualization, it's important to use certain parameters on your CT. Um, these are kind of listed in a, in a white paper that goes into further detail, but I just want to point, most people know about the KV that they're supposed to use, the ideally being 120. I think where people get things miss out of is, is choosing settings like exposure time and artifacts repression. There are a lot of things that, that change how things are visualized. Also, um, when you are using Marigel and you're using fiducials, right? You want to use fiducials that don't create artifact. They don't make it harder for you to visualize the rest of the stuff. So I highly recommend you consider low artifact fiducials like gold, anchor, and visocoil. That'll help you be able to visualize this better. And just to come full circle, you know, we, we know that Marigel is one of the options you may consider. Uh, as for an implant. And the other option is space OAR. And and one of the things that gets talked a lot about is, you know, the CT visibility. You know, we all, in as physicists and as uh, medical dissimetrists, we know that we don't plan. We don't plan on a, on a CT with contrast, right? Um, and the reason we don't do it is because we know that when you use iodine in contrast, it impacts how the dose calculation works, right? It's been a known fact, and it's something that we've all accepted. Well, I, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to consider what happens when you use spacer or view, which has contrast in the spacer. You know, what is the impact uh, of this contrast on the dose calculation that you have going on? A lot of our algorithms are optimized to take you know, tissue-like substances, not things with much higher density. And how does that impact? There was an interesting paper that recently came out and talks about the dysmetric effects of oral contrast in, in planning. And they looked at it for pelvis cases, um, just early work. And they saw that, you know, when you have VMAT plants, you are going to be introducing some differences. Um, the extent of which is still to be debated and we're still getting good data on it.
But I think this is a consideration that we all need to, to consider when, we, when we're dealing with um, spacers that have contrast injected in them. Thank you again for your time. There's an email that you can use to send me questions directly if you have any.